It was the last Friday of May, and though this had been the coldest spring that anyone could remember, it had at last warmed up, and quite suddenly. Eager to get out after weeks of unseasonable cold and rain, Daphne and I decided to do a 12-mile hike through the rapidly greening forest, sticking to trails and byways rarely used and little known. We decided to make the entire trip following the tributaries of a little river and keep to the deep and old Acadian forest. The day was hot and piling cumulonimbus clouds promised rain the next day, and the humidity was slowly building. The route would provide unlimited opportunities to swim in the shallow pools and a limitless water supply. It's a lot lighter to carry a couple small water bottles and a water filter than a good six liters of water each. It would be a slow and leisurely hike. We were in no rush to end it and would stop often to photograph and enjoy the cornucopia that is the springtime forest. One might have expected cooler temperatures here in the highlands, but in the depths of this mountaintop valley, the wind was entirely stopped. But the heat made conditions good for wildlife, in particular the bumblebees who had struggled through such a tumultuous spring. These fuzzy orange-belted bumblebees were everywhere, enjoying the new spring flowers, especially the dandelions, rich with both pollen and nectar. And the protein in the pollen is especially important for them at this time of the year, when the queens are gathering food to start their new broods. Soon we bade goodbye to the little creatures and continued up the meadow into the Acadian forest. The sweltering heat and the dead still air made us eager to reach the shadows of the forest. Woodlands are natural air conditioners and each tree transpires several hundred gallons of water per day. By transporting underground water up to their leaves and releasing it into the atmosphere, this creates a refrigeration effect so that forests can regulate their own temperatures. And a mature forest can be as much as 10 degrees Fahrenheit lower than the air beyond it due to this. And all around us was nature's cornucopia. Here is Pearly Everlasting with its tender, edible leaves that can also be used to make incense. And here we have a species of wild mustard that prefers to grow near streams. At this time of the year, the entire plant is succulent, tender, and tastes like steamed beet leaves with a little spicy mustard added. While there are some 30,000 species of mustard in the world, you can learn to tell them all just by identifying their blossoms. And I photographed this small tree just because it is one I don't know. Having never seen it anywhere in the forest before, I suspect it is a yard ornamental that has gone wild. I'll look it up later. Here are wild cherry blossoms. We snacked on these now and then as we went. They have a taste like sweet almonds, though it takes a moment before it hits you. Eventually these blossoms will develop into wild cherries. But in the blossom state, that almond taste is due to a small bit of cyanide in the flower. Not enough to cause you harm, unless you have a lot. Just as we entered the shadows of the forest, we encountered sphagnum moss in a stand of spruces that surrounded the forest like sentinels. Its antimicrobial properties keep wounds clean. As we pushed deeper into forest shadow, we encountered a vigorous tributary coming down out of the top of the highlands, no doubt spring-fed, and its brisk waters were cool and vigorous. Great stones and fallen logs made for frequent pools and eddies in the stream, perfect terrain for trout. In this little pool right here there are four, three to the left and one to the right as if leading the way. And there is another hiding in the shadow of that stone. There he is. The heat of spring is so new that in the deepest shadows of the high ground one can still find small patches of snow. And here a black-capped chickadee seems to be taking advantage of the newly revealed seeds. While on this moss-covered snag, we find a rich growth of horseshoe fungus, Fomes fomentarius, useful as medicine, leather, and for starting fire. And at the base of the tree, edible trout lilies. Not my favorite vegetable, but perfectly acceptable. And all around in nooks and crannies of the birches, there is Inonotus obliquus, the medicinal chaga fungus. And on fallen logs, thick growths of the turkey tail mushroom, also medicinal and known as Tremati's versicolor. Having hiked about four miles into the forest, we decide to stop for our first break along an almost never used old logging road. And when I say almost never used, I mean after years, I have only ever seen one vehicle come through here. The tall trees form a supreme riparian environment, and the sheltering walls of the valley make for an undisturbed setting, a sanctuary of wildlife. The music of various songbirds is all around, though I can't quite tell the species of the one up there at the fork of those branches. 
Nice to hear them, though. As Daphne settles into making lunch, I explore the little sunlit breaks around us in the forest, finding each to be filled with the delicate beauty of purple-blue violets. This edible flower has a perfumey taste and is great for making salads and candies. And in the nearby shade is witch hobble or hobble bush. It particularly loves to grow in shaded forests near streams and already sports clusters of white blossoms that will develop in time into berries about the size of peanut M&Ms that taste like dates basted in honey. Though I have lived all my life in the forest, I have never ceased to be amazed at the gifts this living landscape so willingly offers. It cleans the air, purifies the water, retains good soil, and everywhere you turn offers abundant fish, game, and forage. Knowing we have many miles ahead of us, Daphne has eaten her lunch and decided to take a nap in the gentle shade of the forest. Well, I noticed that just behind her, there is another chaga conch growing on another birch tree. And just off to her right, a pair of red-belted fungi sprout from dead wood. Both have antimicrobial properties, and I figure each are about equally medicinal. Though red-belted fungi is everywhere, and much easier to find. So abundant is the springtime forest that there is food right here at our backpacks, more wild mustard and dandelions. And just to my right, a rosette of fresh oxide daisy leaves. I pick the entire rosette and stuff it onto my pork and cheese sandwich, along with a couple sprigs of the wild mustard to give it some zest better than mayonnaise. And after giving lunch a little time to settle, Daphne and I continue our journey along the Riparian Valley. We are coming into wilder terrain and find wildlife more easily. Here we encounter a small flock of waxwings. I think these are bohemian waxwings, which are often to be seen in this sequestered mountain valley. And they always warm my heart. These are gentle birds that, unlike many other birds, are not really territorial. They never really seem to squabble with each other. They simply fly about sharing the fruit and berries of the trees, and living peacefully with the world about them and with each other, a thing I think we humans could stand to learn from them. As we progress deeper into the Acadian forest, the forest floor turns into a sea of wild wintergreen. We chew on a few of the leaves, but don't stop to forage any as we already have an abundance back at the cottage. And in a semi-open break, we find comfrey, which has a variety of medicinal uses. And in a sheltered area where the wind never hits, we find leftover highbush cranberries from the last season. Half dried from the long winter, the berries are still good. And I snag several bunches to go on our dinner sandwiches. A short ways ahead, passing through a thicket, we come across several grouse females. It is time to brood and raise chicks, and they are out and about a bit less cautiously than usual. And in a bear break, we find the fresh scat of a moderately sized black bear. It's been hot and dry for several days, but this scat is still moist and dark, and it looks as though it's been eating meat. A more careful look reveals deer fur in the scat, and it was dropped here no more than a few hours ago. About a mile from where we sighted the bear scat, Daphne declares that she's ready for a mid-afternoon break. We dig some venison jerky out the packs and share a little bit with Gilly Doo, our dog while we both marvel at the enormous spruces, white pines, and hemlocks that grow in the sequestered regions of this mountain valley. Gilly Doo, on the other hand, has other plans. Noticing shadows flitting about in the little river, he dives in to do a little trout fishing. He's having fun chasing them about, though I don't think he actually is all that concerned about whether or not he gets them. It's a hot day and he's a border collie and has very thick fur. Mostly I think he's just happy to cool down. Back and forth he goes, glancing at the rocks, as if hunting, but he doesn't really have his heart put in it. Until, all of a sudden, something catches his eye and he dips his head in the water and for just a moment I thought he had a fish, but no, it was just a twig. But while he has his fun, I decide to replenish our water supply. I love this ceramic silver oxide water filter. I've had it for about 10 years, but each filter is rated for several thousand liters, so I imagine I'll still be using it a long time from now. Moving on, we come to a thick old maple wood that is carpeted in spring beauty flowers. These delicate flowers are edible and sweet and have little tubers beneath them called fairy spuds that taste like potatoes. 
but I almost never harvest them because they are so slow growing and they have become scarce due to the Department of Lands and Forestry's abuse of forestry practices, which has grossly endangered their environment. And around is more trout lily and young Canada Mayflower that will soon sport cranberry-like berries. And false or true Solomon seal, it will be easiest to distinguish the one from the other when the blossoms and then the berries begin to form. Both have parts that are edible in different times and ways. In the deeper forest shadows, we find little colonies here and there of ostrich ferns, especially where the shade is very deep, some are still young and tender, often very thick. So while this plant is uncommon, but not endangered, we fill up a bag to take home with us. All this variety of wonderful edibles appears best in old and mature forest, either directly in the shadows or in little breaks. Everywhere you turn, a healthy forest gives abundantly. Here is a cluster of cucumber-flavored bluebead lily growing beneath hobble bush, which will soon yield an abundance of date-like berries. But wait, there's more. Because in front of the hobble bush is a thicket of wildwood sarsaparilla. And just in front of that, yet more cucumber-flavored bluebead lily. This forest, so beautiful for its unspoiled nature and generous with its abundance, is a gift. But as we reach the halfway mark and it is time to start following trails back to the cottage, I pause to send up my small drone, Eco 3, to get a bird's eye view of this wonderful, unbelievably beautiful place. For such forests are becoming rare in the world. You will not find these generous lands in clear cuts, nor replanted forest replantations. Such a forest is healthy because its water, and especially its soil, are undisturbed, allowing it to host a broad biodiversity. Flora, fauna, and fungi, they keep everything in balance, so that everything can benefit. These forests are resistant to storms, fire, and drought, and offer treasures of beauty, medicine, and food that are beyond price. Such forests are cornucopias that can provide for all of us, but only so long as we take care of them. Thank you for watching. The Naturalist Program is committed to the reliable coverage of all matter of topics relating to natural science, from ecology and conservation, to the nature of the universe beyond our Earth, and making that information practical with solid advice on living well with the natural world. If you appreciate the program, please take a moment to subscribe. Subscribing costs nothing and never will, but it sure helps a lot.